Hey, what's up? So a bunch of you have commented on my plasma compression videos on how they produce a ton of x-ray emissions, and that is unsafe for me to be in the same room while undergoing the experiments. These experiments were meant to show how low energy demonstrations of atoms can be fused together, creating a narrow region of superheated plasma. Now, some of you are thinking of the Lorentz force where the magnetic field acts perpendicular to the electron velocity vectors, but similar to light, plasma is not linearly polarized. So the electron velocity vectors are at different angles, and in addition to the magnetic field, the plasma begins to spiral. With theta pinch, the plasma column is created from a high voltage source. Then a coil of wires wrapped around the plasma channel to create a magnetic field along the channel axis. As the magnetic field is increased, the particle's spiral radius is reduced, and x-rays can be emitted. So, how are x-rays produced? The x-rays are produced from the branched lung radiation from the free electrons rolling in the narrow channel of the plasma. But the maximum energy the uh, high energy photons can have is up to the maximum energy of the electron measured in KeV. The maximum voltage from the plasma channel that I'm using is around 3000 volts. So the x-rays emitted from the Bremsen lung radiation will be very low soft x-rays. Hopefully the energy from the x-rays produced are not high enough to penetrate the thick glass that I'm using for the vacuum chamber or even human tissue. But I won't know until I test it. So I'm trying to find out if I could determine if there's x-rays produced or detectable using a low energy x-ray intensifying screen that I purchased off of eBay. I used to use a Geiger counter, but a Geiger counter is only useful if there is multiple counts of um, x-rays or high energy photons from a period of time. What I'm doing, what will happen for my experiment would be a uh, x-ray pulse. And the Geiger counter would be completely useless for that because it will count that as one pulse versus uh, total energy output of the x-ray. The problem is the intensifying screen that I purchased is only effective at cryogenic temperatures. But due to my budget and setup, I'll have to settle for a hot shed in the summer. But if the results show something interesting, then I would probably bring myself to invest into a method to cool down the intensifying screen to its operating temperature. So I put the x-ray intensifying screen inside of a black box void of any light and a camera at the other end to observe if the screen is illuminating. If the x-ray screen lights up, then boom, we have x-rays. But if the x-ray screen does not light up, then it means that I need to try harder, meaning um, the duration is too short for the x-ray screen to actually pick up anything, or the temperature is too high, the x-rays didn't penetrate far enough to actually hit the screen, or the camera is too dimmed where it cannot pick up the light that's emanating from the x-ray screen. So what that means is, yes, I'll need to try harder to detect x-rays and I would have to invest more money into trying to figure out if that is, um, there's any x-rays being present. So I'm using a Pi camera to take long exposure shots of like 10 seconds of the tenth fire screen as the theta pinch was executed and the long exposure picture was sent to a Raspberry Pi so I could download it remotely. And a baseline picture was taken first, as well as the pictures throughout the experiments, as well as the uh, end picture, just to see if there's any changes in the image sensor. The entire test setup is controlled by Raspberry Pi, and the Pi is connected to a network using the Wi-Fi. And so if something goes wrong, it wouldn't destroy more than just what was inside the shed, and I wouldn't risk sending high voltage to uh, any of the circuits inside my house. So the Raspberry Pi controls a relay board that controls the vacuum pump, the high voltage power supply, as well as the charge controller, which I set the voltage that I want to charge it to beforehand, and the uh, Venturi pump to trigger the uh, spark gap, as well as to trigger the high-speed camera, all while I'm sitting comfortably in my home, away from any possible explosions or uh, any x-ray pulse or something like that. So the Venturi switch works by pulling a vacuum in a chamber where the high voltage electrodes are separated by about a centimeter. The low pressure decreases to the breakdown voltage of the air so that the arc can actually form and acts as a switch to the capacitor so it can completely discharge. The arc acts as a low resistant wire and the amount of energy dissipated through the arc is actually negligible. The added benefit of using a Venturi switch or a vacuum switch is that it is quiet. Typical spark gap switches are loud. It's like when you just touch two electrodes to the capacitor, it sounds like a gunshot, whereas this right here sounds like a pin drop. It is very silent. I also added a safety discharge relay to ensure that the capacitor is completely discharged, as well as the uh, discharge is going through an inductor to slow the rate of current. So moving on to the experiment, here's what the intensifying screen looks like in a black box in a very dim light, just so you can see what the uh, screen's positions are, and if I need to use them as an overlay on the actual experiment images that I get. Next is the baseline image. I had to get the exposures set to maximum in the post-processing to actually see anything. The image shows a baseline of the noise of the image sensor, and the exposure is set to 10 seconds. Um, the ISO is also set to 100 just to minimize the noise on the sensor. Now with that out the way, let's start our first test. The Raspberry Pi is running through a sequence. The vacuum pump has already been turning on and running for five minutes just so it could pull the full vacuum inside the chamber. This is the slow motion video. 
Unfortunately, I needed to cover the inventory switch because the light emitting from it actually drowned out everything and I couldn't see what I wanted to show during the experiment. So um, I had to do that for the next test. This is the image in the black box. Similar to the baseline, I had to turn the exposure up in post-processing to the maximum setting, but it doesn't look like any x-rays are present due to the pixels not um, being in line with where the intensifying screen is. But instead, what we are seeing is the electromagnetic interference from the high voltage discharge of the capacitor. For the next test, I covered the inventory switch so we could actually dim the light, but the light was still too bright to see anything useful. And the image for the black box showed similar to results from the first one, but it was a little bit dimmer. So it didn't look like we're getting anything from the theta pinch. So then I tried switching the uh, vacuum chamber to um, a different method using the Z pinch. And I don't want to spoil too much because I'm actually currently working on the next video that's going to go more into detail on this. But this is the image from the black box where there is a significant amount of electromagnetic interference from this. And uh, it doesn't look like there was any x-rays captured, but there was also a vacuum leak inside the chamber. And I still tested it because a fix would actually cause me to delay testing for another day anyway. So um, I did the test with the vacuum leak and then sealed the vacuum and started the next test on the next day. I knew this test was going to be it. I knew I was going to get some x-rays once we get the vacuum chamber completely sealed and ready to go. This was going to be the test to do it. So here we go, running the tests, running sequence, fingers crossed. So that just happened. I didn't have any other cameras running because this was um, just the test on the baseline and uh, the only Im image I had from was from my surveillance video. Even though my room was pretty far away from the shed, it sounded like somebody set up a firecracker next to my window. It was so freaking loud. I thought someone was going to call the cops on me. So going through the investigation, here's what I think will happen during the failure. Here's a test setup and the rough wire connection diagram. I wanted to get a baseline image from the black box, so I ran the sequence, but for some reason the relay for the high voltage power supply switch was stuck closed, which was charging the capacitor unknowingly to me. Um, all the indicators showed that everything was off, but um, the thing was charging. And from the surveillance video with my great resolution, I could not tell what the voltage reading was on the voltmeter that I had. And also I couldn't see the actual current draw from the lab bench power supply. So the capacitor is charged to 3,300 volts and the fire sequence ran. Um, so here's the uh, chart of how the um, current was flowing. The red light indicates the current. So the vacuum switch was about to send the, um, the high voltage somewhere, but the vacuum tube was at atmospheric pressure. So it wasn't gonna go to discharge through there. Instead, the current flowed through the path of least resistance and went through the Venturi relay. Because the gap on the relay was small enough, the arc actually jumped between the uh, relay to ground. And, and from there, it went to the 12 volt distribution board and was disseminated to everything connected to it, including my Raspberry Pi. So the closest path to ground was through my high voltage power supply. And it jumped from the gap from my ZVS driver to ground to the capacitor. And it blew up everything in its path inside the power supply. I guess the only good thing came out of this is it demonstrated what 3500 joules can do. Luckily I made a video on how to build a charge controller, so all I have to do is just follow that and incorporate the lessons learned to help improve the circuit. More to come. Thanks for watching.